So this is an unusual session. And uh, over the course of the year that it takes to put together a conference like this, sometimes combinations fall together in ways that really build enormous anticipation even in the people who work on it day by day. This, for me, is one such pod. I'm going to present three men of science, each of whom have overwhelming day jobs, some of them two or three overwhelming day jobs, but who each in their own time pursue a biblical interest that I think could well qualify as an obsession. Now, the first man I'm going to present is Daniel Friedman. Now, he's headed up Canada's foremost space company for many years. This is the company that builds the Canada Arm, the famous Canada Arm, of which we're all inordinately proud. But his particular obsession has been to, rec to, reconcile, sorry, to reconcile the book of Genesis with its account of creation, to reconcile that with everything that's known in today's science about the creation of the universe. The numbers in the book of Genesis amount to about 6,000 years. The accepted date for the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years. Daniel Friedman thinks he can reconcile those two numbers. Thank you. Good morning. Well, I am going to address, is there a blueprint for the universe? Now, I thought this was an important topic until a couple of hours ago. <laughs> but uh, you all now know what I know, which is once we get a hold of this blueprint, we just need one of those 3D printers and we're done. <laughs> so I hope you're paying attention. I've got to go quickly afterwards. Um, so, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I found a blueprint to my home. Big scroll, opened it up, blue actually, uh, lots of blue lines and numbers. And despite having almost failed uh, engineering drawing, uh, I was able to read that blueprint and correlate it to my home. And I can match every room in the home with every room in the blueprint, and it all makes perfect sense. It all fits. That's what a blueprint is. Now, what about this other scroll, the Bible? You can also unroll it. It's pretty complicated. You saw yesterday in yoga class that these Hebrew letters have pretty interesting shapes. And obviously, they make words. But when you unroll the blueprint, as Moses said, uh, you find out that uh, the universe is about 5,772 years old. Everything happened in six days. And uh, that's pretty different from science. Science says it all spanned 13.7 billion years. Life itself started 500 million years ago, if you can phantom that, in terms of macroscopic life. Microscopic life started 3.5 billion years ago. And even ourselves, we're 200,000, uh, been around for 200,000 years. So this is a big problem. It's, it's been a problem for a couple of hundred years. It's best known as the creation evolution controversy or the origins debate. It's been mostly an academic subject and mostly a southern U.S. subject for a long time. It's still a big issue in the U.S. presidential elections as we speak. Um, but actually, it's spread throughout the whole world. People in Egypt are arguing about this. People in Brazil are arguing about this. Turkey is arguing about this. I don't know about Canada. Um, and more importantly, it's intergenerational. If you ask 65-year and older people if the Bible is correct, the vast majority say yes. If you ask 18 to 25-year-olds if the Bible is correct, the vast majority say no. This is at the root of the issue. Now, I'm going to stick to what happened and when it happened for the first part. We'll go back to how, which is what everybody loves to argue about later. But I don't see any point in arguing about how things happened. I mean, we all know now it's a 3D printer. But um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see any point in arguing about how until we, we settle the situation. So let me spend a minute on science. 
We look at our cosmos through all kinds of uh, uh, satellites and telescopes. We dig around on the Earth and find all kinds of bones and t teeth and feces and hair and so on. We have the amazing ability now not only to put all those bones together, as I'm sure you've seen for dinosaurs, but we can do DNA analysis, compare the DNA of everything we find with everything else we found, where everything else is alive today. That's only possible in the last 10 years or so. And we are able, through those two sciences, to put together a complete timeline of what happened, when it happened, right from the beginning, 13.7 billion years ago, until today. A very accurate timeline. And the most important thing I want you to take away from this is that a lot of this timeline is direct observation. I don't need to know anything about the theory of evolution, which everybody argues about with the creationists, to settle the timeline of the appearance of life on Earth. I just need to understand fossils, DNA, dating. Here there were no dinosaurs, here there were dinosaurs, here there were no dinosaurs. No theory required. It's like a picture album of your kids. Okay? Some of the things you need a theory for, but most of the dates I'm going to show you today are straightforward observation and deniable. That's a science story. I'm sure you've heard lots of cosmology at Idea City before. I won't go into that. What about the document that claims to be the blueprint, the Bible? Well, it also has a timeline. Uh, hopefully, some recall reading Genesis. It says on day one this happened, on day two this happened, on day three this happened. That's a timeline. By the time we get to the end of day six and Adam sins, uh, we then count uh, 5,772 years. Some people would argue with that, but most people agree it's thousands of years of chronology since then. So those six days were about 6,000 years ago. Now, the thing we have to understand about Genesis and the five books of Moses is that they're the quick guide. Now, I opened up my, my new present, thank you, Idea City, yesterday, the Blackberry, and there no longer is a quick guide. It's just a, a big, long page that tells you that here's the power on button, and then just follow the instructions on the screen. But if you can just put yourself back a few years, you used to get a one page when you didn't have touch screens, you used to get a one-page instruction that told you how to use your phone, right? Press this button, this button, you're making a call. Now, I could never make those things work, but most people can. <laughs> and uh, you are making the call. That's a quick guide. Now, if you wanted to know how much long distance was going to cost you or how to put stuff in your, in your contact file or, you know, the, the hard stuff, you had to go to a big document called the user's guide. The quick guide, in the case of the Bible, comes with a user's guide a more detailed document, which is uh, traditionally uh, known as the oral tradition in Judaism. That oral tradition, uh, thankfully, has been put into writing, has been translated to English, which is good for me, and, uh, and we have that. And if you look at the sources in my book that I used to elaborate on 2,000 words, Genesis 1, chapter 1 of Genesis, which tells the whole story, is 2,000 words. That's not many words. Uh, when you look at the tradition that elaborates that, you end up with hundreds and hundreds of pages. So that's the level of detail that we actually have. And it rivals a cosmology book or a biology book in terms of detail. Now, I brought you a couple of examples just to give you a feel for it. So day six is a busy day. A lot of stuff happens in day six. Virtually all of life, uh, man, all the trouble with Eve, all that good stuff. <laughs> so. Um, when you read Genesis, it tells you all these things, but it's hard to tell when it happened. It's actually hard to tell in what order it all happened at, at times. The, the oral tradition tells us. It goes hour by hour on day six and says, in the first hour this happened, in the second hour this happened, in the third hour this happened, and so on. And it tells us very clearly when all that happened. You go deeper into the sources, you can find information after the second. For example, we know that Adam ate the fateful fruit at 3 p.m. on Friday. Friday is day six. At 3 p.m., not at 2.59, not at 3.01. 3 p.m., it's documented. Thousands of year old sources. 3 p.m., sharp. <laughs> Three hours before the Sabbath, which is nominally at 6 p.m. We also have cosmology books. Cosmology books that tell us quite a bit of detail. So we know in day four, the sun and the moon were made. It's pretty clear from the text that so we're kind of completed near the end of the day. But, you know, which was first, etc. 
Well, it tells us the sun was made first, the moon came within two-thirds of an hour after. Don't have that one exactly, but it's close. Science doesn't have it exactly either, actually. We can't tell how old exactly it is. And so on. So what I want you to, the impression I want you to get from this is that when you string all this out, you get a very detailed timeline. Not as detailed as science. This is a book, not a book of science. It's a, book, a manual for life. But I can pull out 20 events that you will all recognize in science books. Now, here's the thing I neglected to tell you about the blueprint on my home. It turns out that on the lower right-hand corner of the blueprint, there's this little box that says scale. One inch equal eight feet. Without that scale, I would have thrown that piece of paper away a long time ago. It would make absolutely no sense. Once you know that scale, that one inch equal eight feet, everything makes sense on the blueprint. Every blueprint comes with a scale. The Bible must have a scale. Now, like Moses, I got called to read from the, from the Torah um, recently, and I checked on the right-hand side, and it's not there. It's a, it's a problem. <laughs> but it is in the Hebrew letters. We saw yesterday the Hebrew letters. They are letters just like in English, in the sense that they make words. Uh, we did our yoga. We saw the shape. Those pictographs are critical. Uh, I got some good news and bad news. The good news is that the letters are also numbers, so everything in the Bible is a formula. The bad news is today's yoga is going to be to the numbers, not the shapes. <laughs> I won't be teaching you that class. Um, so we have the story told in creation days, and we keep time in human time. I'm not going to go into all these details here for lack of time, but we can find the code in the Bible that converts from a creation day all the way to what we measure in science. And Although I can't show you how to do it, I can tell you it's incredibly simple. One creation day is 1,000 times 7,000 times 365. One creation day is two and a half billion years. It's an exact calculation. It's the number of days in the year, 325, 365. That's to convert from days to years. And it's just two other numbers, 1,000 and 7,000. Not big fancy things, not 3.1415 pi, no Planck's constant, none of that good stuff. 1,000 times 7,000. I cannot fudge it. There's no decimal place. It's just a one and a seven and a few zeros. When I take that simple formula and I apply it to the whole timeline, I end up with a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet on the bottom half of the slide, that converts those creation days to our time. And it's a hell of a lot simpler than the Mayan candle, let me tell you that. <laughs> uh, it may sound complicated, but it's simpler. And what does it say? It says that everything matches perfectly to the last decimal place. Example, from the in the beginning until today, 13.74 billion years. It's actually 13.742. That's one more decimal place accurate than science has it. First life. Beginning of day five, 6 a.m., day five, let the waters team, that's microscopic life in the oceans. That's the first fossils in the fossil record on the ocean. My favorite, and God planted the garden. That's at noon on Friday. He started planting. He planted for three hours. Got a lot more patience than I do about gardening. Um, noon on day Friday. 426 million years ago, I just checked again, the current best date in science, the first plant, 427 million years ago. It was 420 when I did this. Perfect match except for one thing, I will be honest, one thing doesn't match. So that's what happened and when it happened. We've taken the creation days, multiplied it by 1,000, 7,000, the days of the year, in the year, and we get this perfect match. Now, what about how? How is the big argument? How did all this happen? Um, what does it say about that? Well, one answer is pretty simple. It says God made everything. But it's not so simple because we have to understand how he did make everything and therefore how we might perceive it. And it turns out that Genesis is incredibly explicit in telling us that everything that happened in that chapter 1, which is all of these things, happened in a cause and effect manner, and it happened using natural laws. None of this business of five bucks turning into 50 bucks. <laughs> uh, none of that. 
Okay? Natural laws, cause and effect. Now, you look up the definition of science in the dictionary. It says something that's explained by cause and effect using a natural law. What Genesis is telling us, that the way this whole thing was put together is the same way we study it through science. So we should not be surprised that when we study cosmology and biology through the scientific method, we are going to get to exactly the right answer. We're going to understand it all, and it's all going to make sense, and we're going to think it all happened naturally. That was the plan. But three clues were left behind. There's three times that the text clearly tells us that there was something that wasn't done with natural laws. Now, elsewhere in the Bible, by the way, lots of stuff happened without natural laws. You go to the Noah story, uh, lots of miracles going on there. That's way harder to explain. That's my next book. <laughs> Too many miracles. This one's easy. This is all scientific. The name that God uses when he narrates this part of the story, he has different names. It's the name engineer. He says, I'm an engineer. I'm doing this stuff. No, 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 no uh, four-letter name, which is, uh, conveys other things. But it does say sp specifically in the text that three things did not come out naturally. Three things were out of nothing, ex nihilo creation. These three things correspond today to the three unanswered questions, biggest unanswered questions about our origins in science. This is what we're struggling with today. The text is telling us we're going to understand everything, on those three things, you're going to have a hell of a hard time getting right to the bottom of it. And that's exactly what's happening. Example. In the whole cosmology story, the first four days, there's only one thing that it says we're going to struggle with. The very, very beginning. Everything else was natural, cause and effect from existing materials. We'll understand. The Big Bang Theory understands. It's a brilliant theory. understands that really clearly but we don't really understand today how that beginning happened. And in fact, the more we study it, the worse it gets, because we discover the more and more we study it, the more fine-tuned that very beginning was. It was incredibly fine-tuned. Genesis is telling us, you're not going to get to the answer there all the way. Second, ex uh, I can't do all the examples, the human soul. Now, we're all, in biology, are kind of uh, surprised that we're basically a nice, clean-shaven, at least today I am, on the weekends maybe not, monkey. Um, Genesis is telling us that our bodies were made just like the bodies of the animals. We are supposed to die. That's his fault, by the way. Um, we are supposed to procreate the way we do. We're supposed to eat the way we do, sleep the way we do, and so on. All those bodily functions that make us look pretty similar. We are supposed to have DNA very similar to, to apes. That's also in the Bible, way before Darwin. But our soul, whatever that is, is divine. And what is that defined as in the Bible? The ability to speak and the ability to come to Idea City. <laughs> because the second thing is our ability to envision the future, to understand the past, to make plans for the future. Any animal can tell you I'm hot or I'm cold right now or I'm hungry. But we can tell you, we, as we heard yesterday from Rex, we might be hungry in 50 years if we don't do something about the planet. Animals don't talk like that. So that's the whole situation. That's what, how we're different. That's the part we won't quite understand. So to wrap it all up, the Genesis account through a very simple formula that you can find in the Bible, uh, all explained in my book, the Genesis 1 code, tells you how everything fits and tells you the three areas where we're going to struggle in life when we finally get to the answers, and that's where we're struggling today. Thank you very much.